study from the Word of God. Again, thank you for being here. Good to have you. I did want to mention that uh, we all continue to remember, as Ron prayed in his prayer tonight, we remember the Sneed family and the DeFour family, Morris family. Um, and we continue to pray that uh, Brother DeFour will rest peacefully. Uh, Patrick said he maybe rallied just a tad this afternoon and acknowledged his wife. That sometimes happen at these stages of life. And we certainly want to remember that good family in our prayers. And I know we are, and I know we mean that very sincerely. So I know they very much appreciate that. Ron also mentioned our college population and the fact that many of them will be traveling, and we certainly wish them Godspeed. I've told a couple of them, make sure you don't travel home until you're good and rested. So uh, uh, I think that's good advice. I've known a few who left out tired and had a little trouble getting home. So if you need to heed that advice, then do that. But we'll look forward to having you back. You're always missed. And as all of you know, you offer a very special part of our assembly and a part of our work. So we will miss you while you are gone. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is a passage that I hear, but I don't fully understand. I think it's hard for us to identify with what happens in the heavenly places. The fact that Paul says that we are to be strong in the Lord, I think we understand that. And I think we understand conceptually that he says you need to be careful to understand what the wiles of the devil are. And you need to be able to fight against those things. But when he tells me that my battle is not against flesh and blood, it is against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. I don't fully understand that. I kind of wrestle with that, to use the terminology here. I have an idea about that, but I wrestle with that a little bit because I don't understand fully what takes place in that realm. And I think because of that, we struggle a little bit with a text like Luke 4. I want you to turn to that text, and let's look at that a little bit again tonight. Jared, in his invitation Wednesday night, referred to this. And I actually, in my thinking about this, I thought about a couple of things that he said that stirred and spurred my interest in what I want to talk to you about tonight. So I want to read, beginning in Luke 4, verse 1, the story, again, of the temptation of Jesus as Luke records it. Matthew and Mark also record it, but I want to, leave, I want to read Luke's account tonight. Luke 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And then he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. 
Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Ephesians 6, 10, 11, and 12 identify the battle that's waged in the spiritual realm. I think Luke 4 identifies the battle that's waged in the spiritual realm being waged on earth. And so there's a lot about this I don't understand, frankly. I want you to listen carefully to verse 6. Notice what is said specifically in that verse. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. In Acts 2, the apostles preached this, that Jesus Christ has been made Lord and Christ. The idea of being made Lord means that He has been made a ruler of one's life. The idea that He has been made Lord means that He has been given this authority. And yet Satan said to Jesus, I have the authority. I don't know whether you've ever thought about that or not. But not only does Jesus, or rather not only does Satan make this bold claim here in Luke 4 and verse 6. In John 16, Jesus says that Satan is the ruler of the world. Jesus himself said that Satan is the ruler of this world. But what's interesting about that is, first of all, that I don't completely understand that. Not that I completely understand a lot of things in Scripture. But of the claim, I think it's interesting that little is revealed in Scripture really about the nature of this rule of Satan. Or the circumstance under which it came to Satan. So if I ask you the question, how did Satan get this? Satan said, I have it. And Jesus said, yes, he does. My question to you is, how did he get it? And in what sense does he have it? And I think, think maybe us thinking about the question helps us understand then how we deal with it, just like how Christ himself dealt with it. You know, some connect Satan's fall and his rule to his fall. Now, again, I'm going to ask you this question. What happened to Satan? He was a created being. What happened to him? Well, we know little about his fall. I want you to turn over to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And I'm going to read specifically in just a moment from, Luke, from Isaiah 14. But I want you to think about some things that happened. In Isaiah's book, in the prophecy which Isaiah presented, really in chapter 13... Isaiah said, this is a burden against Babylon. Isaiah was saying, I'm going to tell you about Babylon. Yes, Babylon will overtake you, but when they do, you must understand that even Babylon is going to bear a burden. There's going to be some things happen to Babylon that you need to be aware of. So beginning in chapter 13, really, in Isaiah, he talks about that. And in verse 14, he's saying to, to Israel, I'm, I'm telling you this because ultimately God is going to show mercy to you. And he's going to do that by this Babylonian empire falling. So beginning in verse 3 of chapter 14, it says, It shall come to pass in the day that the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow, from your fear, and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve, that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. And so these next several statements that are made in chapter 14 are about Babylon and about the king of Babylon. So... That when you get to verse 12 and you hear this language, how you are fallen from heaven. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you, you who weakened the nations. The reaction of a lot of people is that this is a reference to Satan falling from heaven. But I would suggest that that isn't what he's talking about. Now it may be true that Satan fell from heaven. That may very well be true, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here necessarily because the context is the context of 
Jesus declaring, or rather Isaiah declaring, that this son of the morning, referring to, I think, the king of Babylon in its context, is the one who fell. The same idea is expressed in a, in a different sense in Luke 10. Turn back over to the New Testament and look at Luke, the 10th chapter. When, when Jesus sends the 70 out, in what we sometimes call the limited commission, and they return, verse 17 of Luke 10 says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Jesus himself declares that he has seen Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And that may very well be the case. But again, in this context, I think what Jesus is saying is not so much I have seen Satan fall, but I see the power of Satan who's been held in check by the power of God. His power has fallen because even those whom I'm sending out have power over those who are demons. They can cast out the demons. So what's Jesus talking about? Is he talking about a past fall of Satan from heaven which Jesus himself saw? Or is he talking about Satan's power being taken away by the work of Jesus' disciples? Well, again, in the context, it seems to me that he is talking about the power being taken away. I want you to look at another passage. Turn over to Revelation 12. Look at Revelation 12. Listen to this language beginning in verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Again, this describes Satan... And his angels being cast down out of heaven. It's one of, one of it, three that I've already mentioned that, that talk about this very idea. But it does so again in the context of Christ obtaining victory because of what Christ did and the, his blood casting victory over Satan. So, here's the, point of, here's the point of those points. That none of these passages give us an account of Satan being granted authority over all the earth. So in essence, it doesn't do a whole lot to help us try to figure out what does it mean that Satan has this authority. What we know about Satan's fall comes from inferences, I think, in Scripture rather than direct statements. There are phrases that are mentioned in Scripture. I want, I want to just mention a few. There are phrases that tell us that something happened to Satan. And sometimes these phrases are in the most somewhat obtuse places, if you will. The first is found in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 6. As Paul refers to the quality of elders, he says that if a novice is appointed, he could be puffed up with pride. Okay, notice that. If a novice is appointed, he could be puffed up with pride, leading him to fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Isn't that interesting? Talking about elders. He says if you're not careful, then what you're going to do is you're going to place 
a, a man in a position who is a novice and, and he's not going to be able to handle what it is he does. He could become puffed up evidently like the devil did because he faced that same condemnation. Satan's pride led to his downfall and to his condemnation. And if you're not careful, that can happen to one who is appointed who is a novice. Or in 1 John 3 and verse 8, the passage tells us that Satan has sinned from the beginning. And I think he's referring to the beginning of creation when he deceived the woman in the garden in the beginning. And as we read from Revelation 12, he now deceives really the whole world. So his deception happened in the beginning and it continues even to this day. The real questions I think that we wrestle with regarding Satan's rule is what authority does he actually possess? That's the question that we've raised from the beginning. And in what sense was that, that authority delivered over to him? My God, I'm going to give you my answer. My answer is God is sovereign. Now that might not help in thinking about the answer that you want to hear, but that's my answer. My answer is God is sovereign. And what that means in reference to this question specifically is God can do as He pleases in any way that He pleases at any time that He pleases. Because He is God. And it seems to me that God gave Satan, because He is sovereign, that God gave Satan some level of, the, of control in the world. And He did that through sin. Now the question may come, well, does, does that make God then complicit with sin? And I think the answer to that is no, it doesn't make him complicit in sin. It simply gives Satan the right to exercise evil influence. Satan himself doesn't cause somebody to sin. We choose to do that. But Satan's influence can create that opportunity for us to do that. And this, in my view, is the sense in which Satan's power was delivered to him by God. Is that oversimplified? I don't know. But to me, in my mind, that answers that question. Whatever Satan has, whatever rule Satan has in this world, God has given it to him. For whatever reason, but God has given it to him. So, I would ask this question. What power or authority then does Satan actually possess? I want you to think back about Luke 4. I want you to think about, about the temptations that Jesus was offered in Luke 4. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Did, did Satan really have the authority to look at Jesus and say, if you will acknowledge me, I will give you all these kingdoms. You ever thought about that? Did, did Satan have the authority to say, if you do this, Jesus, then I will give you this? In order for him to give him something, he must have possession of it. And yet, that's the offer that was made. Were these kingdoms even his to offer? I think that's a better way to even ask my question. Well, again, let's think about references that are made in Scripture about how Satan has hold over certain things in our lives. Think about what hardships of the flesh are known as. You remember in Luke 13, you don't have to take necessarily turn there, but Luke 13, 16, there was a woman with the flow of blood and the text tells us that she was bound by Satan. You, you ever read that and go, what does that mean? Well, I think that's what we're answering. I think we're answering the question, what does that mean? What does it mean that she was bound by Satan? Or, or one that we're more familiar with. You remember this statement in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7? Remember what Paul's thorn in the flesh was called? A messenger of Satan. Yet, yeah, it, it's unclear to us. Again, even if we read the, the, the 
messenger of Satan. It's unclear exactly how those things are to be understood. It may be that Satan is allowed to exercise some influence and some negative influence over nature. That could be the case. Again, if you say, well, that's not his place. It's his place if God gives him the opportunity to, for that to be his place. God is sovereign. God can give Satan whatever he wants to give Satan. Now you may say, well, he, he, he can't give him everything. That's God's business. You may say, well, he limits Satan. He may. I believe there is a sense in which he does. But it is strictly God's business. It is not my business. Or it may simply mean that Satan's influence over man in the garden led to, to sickness and death and hardship. And all those natural hardships are traced back to Satan. Not that he has some direct statement about that or some direct control, but the fact that those things happen means that he does have some power. But I want to say this. I, I don't know how all that works in, in terms of the flesh. It's a, it was a messenger of Satan, okay? That's what we know. That's what the text says. We can talk about that. I suppose we can debate what that means. All I know is that's what the text calls it. But most of Satan's power seems to be concerned in the spiritual realm, like Ephesians 6. Like these other passages that were mentioned, like, like really what is happening, I think, in essence, in John or in Luke, the fourth chapter. But in John 8 44, we know that when one follows the desires of Satan, he becomes a child of Satan. John 8 tells us that. He becomes a child of the devil and not a child of God. 1 Timothy 5.15 tells us that those in sin have turned aside to Satan. And I would suggest to us that, that when those things come that tell us we are a child of Satan or we have turned aside to Satan, it means that we are that as a result of choices we make that are a result of the authority that God has given Satan power to possess. If he tempts us, and God does not, but Satan does, it's because God has given him the ability to do that to us. Somebody says that's not fair. Are you questioning God's sovereignty? God can do as he pleases. God can do as he pleases, and he gives us the choice. It's been that way from the get-go. It's been that way from the garden. Here's what I'm telling you. Here's the opportunity. Here's your choice. You make your choice. You, as we sometimes say, you make that choice based upon your free will. We, we talk about that. We understand that. We have that choice. I may yield to Satan's rule or I may yield to God's rule. A sovereign God has given me that choice to make. And we must remember that. He's given me the choice. And while I understand all of that, and while I even understand what does that mean about what God has given, again, I, my answer to that is, God has given him because God's sovereign says, I'll do what I please, and I give him this ability to rule in the world. Now let me ask you this question. Just go back to Luke 4 for just a moment. Now I want you to think about this question. Could Satan have actually given Jesus... The bread? Could he have turned those stones to bread? Could he have given him the kingdoms of the world? And then what, what's interesting to me, the text tells us in Luke 4 that they go from the wilderness, notice this, they go back to Jerusalem. You ever notice that? In the third temptation that's mentioned, they go from the wilderness back to Jerusalem. In my meager, small mind, and what I visualize, if I visualize Jesus and the devil walking along all the way back to Jerusalem and going, okay, this last one's going to be really good. And not, not to make light of it, but he literally, they literally go back to Jerusalem. And in essence, he, the power to not be hurled off or to be hurt if he is hurled off of the Temple Mount. That's what the issue is. If you, if you, Throw yourself off. Your angels will protect you and your angels will heal you. And somebody says, is that actually what that's talking about? I believe that's exactly what that's talking about. Could Jesus had fallen off of that temple mount, hurt himself, and the angels healed him? Absolutely. 
That was the test. That was the temptation. I believe God gave Satan the power to give Jesus what he promised. Everything that he says, I will give you if he could have given him, if Jesus would have done what Satan wanted him to do. That's part of the power of the temptation. If Satan couldn't have done that, and if Jesus knew Satan couldn't have done that, or wouldn't have done that, or couldn't have the power to do that, what temptation would there be? Jesus knew he could. That was the temptation. So what about today? What is it, what is it that Satan rules over? What, what is it that he has this control over? Satan still has influence. Don't you know that? <laughs> you know that, don't you? You know how I know you know that? Because you're tempted by him every day. You're tempted by him every day. You have a choice to make every day. Am I going to do what God said am I, I need to do? Or am I going to do what Satan wants me to do? We are tempted every single day. So in that sense, <coughs> Satan rules over the earth. And he is wily. <laughs> This is not a lesson about necessarily the wiles of the devil. But may I say to all of us that Satan, Satan attacks us in ways, folks, that he knows are the most difficult. Where we are most susceptible. I think about my own life. I think about wiles of the devil... And I think about, I, I, will, I will tell you things. I will tell you this. I, I think that there are ways in which he particularly tempts those of us who are, who have for our, and our roles as evangelists or preachers, I think there are things he does to attack us specifically. I think part of my responsibility is to not be led astray by those things that can not just exclusively attack me and hurt me and cause me to stumble, but because I do what I do, that may be part of his wiles. That's why even the passage that I mentioned last Sunday from 1 Peter 4 stands out to me. When Paul said to Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. I think what Paul had in mind is, you better watch out as a preacher. You better listen to what the devil is trying to do to you. And may I say, each of us find ourselves in circumstances that in some cases are unique to us. They may not be unique in the sense that we are the only ones who have ever run into them. But it may be that they are unique in the sense that they are rare. And the question for each of us comes, will we succumb to the influence of Satan? What does Satan do? Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where do you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and he said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. That's a long way to walk. <laughs> That's a long to and fro. Well, I don't think, I don't think Satan's saying, I'm just walking a lot. I'm walking from here to there and I just keep doing that and I'm in great shape. You, you know that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, I am, I am on the earth and I am I'm offering my influence for evil that you've given me, Lord. You've allowed me to have this influence. Why? Because you're sovereign. I didn't take it. I didn't demand it. I couldn't demand it of you, but you've given it to me. You've given me some of this limited authority and I have this. And Satan told the Lord he had been roaming to and fro on the earth. And I think we have to recognize that this ruler of the earth is just that. And none of us are immune to that. That's what I found out. I know some I know some of what I conclude are some very strong spiritual people. 
and they succumb to temptation. Various ways, but they succumb. Which tells me that nobody's immune. Because if Satan has this kind of authority, then it can affect us adversely, and it does. He's waging the war. He's waging the war on earth. It's waged in heaven between that which is good and evil. But he's waging it here. And I'm going to go back and read something that the, the, the image has stuck in my mind for a long time. I want you to listen again. You can just listen to this passage if you would. This is from Revelation 12 and verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Why would John say there was a loud voice in heaven saying this? You ready for this? Because I think it was a loud voice. Well, why do you say something loud? Because you won't be heard. There was a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. What John was given the ability to see is that ultimately this one called Satan whose name means accuser is doing just that. And in my mind when it says that he is accusing the brethren I believe he is in the heavenly realm accusing the brethren. I believe he's saying to those who are willing to listen to those who have some control in the ultimate authority let me tell you what Kenny's doing. Let me tell you what Brian's doing. Let me tell you what Ann's doing. Let me tell you what Bob's doing. God they're yours but listen to all these things I can accuse them of. He is the accuser of the brethren. And yet in that same context, we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. The, the imagery that I see in Scripture of both, uh, of what happens at the end, is that Satan is accusing and Jesus is deflecting. Isn't that a powerful image to you? What advantage do you think there is in me being washed in the blood of the Lamb? What advantage is that? Well, what's the advantage that we see? When we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, what happens to our sins? They're taken away, right? So when the accuser stands before God and he accuses me, what does he see? Who does he hear? He hears Christ stepping in front saying, He's not guilty. He's one of mine. He's not guilty. He's one of mine. What about somebody who doesn't have the ability of, uh, and who doesn't have the opportunity for Christ or who has not accepted rather the opportunity for Christ for to be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Well, Christ, Christ doesn't do that for that person. See, that's the value of having Christ in your life. When the accuser stands before God saying, look at him, God says, I don't see him. I see Christ. That's a great advantage for us. Do we still, does Satan still have influence over us? Sure he does. And we make choices every day. Sure we do. And we have to do our best to make those choices that are right. Absolutely, we must do that. And when our heart is such that we acknowledge what Christ has done in our life, and our heart is such that we are sorry for what we've done God once again allows and His Son is willing to stand before His own Father and say, He's not guilty because of what I've done for Him. That's a great picture. That's why I can stand before you tonight and say with all of my heart, I believe that I'm justified by the blood of the Lamb. That's how valuable that is. Does Satan still carry influence? Absolutely. 
And ultimately that influence will be completely taken away when he overcomes death, when Jesus totally overcomes death. He's overcome death to a degree. But when he totally overcomes it, when he, he gives that kingdom back to his father, then Satan will have absolutely no rule at all. And if I'm in him, then I have the opportunity to stand before God justified. Does, he have, does Satan have power? Yes, he does. Is he the prince of the world? Yes, he is. But I don't have to be a part of his army. I don't have to be a part of his kingdom. And because I choose not to be. And I choose to live for Christ and to have Christ in my life. I, I would encourage you tonight that if you don't have that hope, that you do something about that. You say, well, Kenny, what does, what does he want me to do? He wants you to believe in him. And if you believe in him, then you'll do what he says. And that's what he wants you to do. Believe in me and who I am and then do what I'm asking you to do. And I would encourage you tonight, if you're here in this audience and you've never done that, that you ought to do that. You need to do that. If you want to have the opportunity to stand justified before God, you must do that. So may I encourage you tonight as we sing this invitation song to do just that as we stand and as we sing.